In business, in education, in sports, in politics, in many areas of social life, there are often situations in which people come together in groups and then begin to share emotions in groups. Think, for example, of a recent team meeting in which you and the other members of a team shared a sense of excitement, perhaps, for an opportunity. Or when you were concerned collectively about the lack of progress in an important project. Think of a protest movement that unites people in their anger towards social injustice. Or a sports team that ignites uh, an entire nation uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, a university that infuses its members with a sense of pride. Now all these are examples of what scholars have come to call group emotions. And group emotions are remarkable because they suggest that how we feel depends at least in part on those who surround us and on the groups that we are part of. Now you might wonder why are group emotions important? Well they are important because how we collectively feel impacts how we collectively behave. For example, in team research, there is evidence that teams that share positive emotions, excitement and enthusiasm, are actually having higher performance levels and feature less conflict than those who don't share such emotions. At the department level, there is evidence that departments that are infused with a negative um, feeling are having higher staff turnover rates than those uh, that are less negative. So how we collectively feel impacts what we can collectively achieve. Now, despite the importance of group emotions, there are many unanswered questions in group emotional research. How do you define group emotions? How do emotions actually converge in groups? What is the mechanism that makes people share a certain feeling, that makes these emotions converge in groups. How big can a group be and still have a group emotion? Um, and what are the consequences uh, of group emotions? What are the facilitators uh, of these consequences? What is it that hinders those consequences? Well, these and other questions are at the center of a review piece that my colleague Martin Kildorf at University College London and I at WHU Otto Beisam School of Management have recently uh, conducted for the Academy of Management Annals. For that review we went through the last 15 years of publications in top journals in organization science, sociology and psychology and we extracted all those papers that were of relevance to the question of group emotion, to the topic of group emotions. Now, in this video here, in this short abstract, I can only cover one particular aspect of our work. And I'll focus on the question of why group emotions converge. Why is it that once we are in a group, we tend to feel alike with other group members? And I'm focusing in part on this particular question because the findings that we obtained as part of our review are startling, in fact. Uh, they show that depending on which particular discipline, academic discipline, you look into, the explanation to that very same question varies fundamentally. So in organizational science, uh, scholars suggest that emotions converge because of interaction processes. Uh, and because of inclination, personal inclinations of the team members, of group members. In sociology, it is all about institutionalization and rules and rituals. Uh, and in psychology, it's all about identification. What group do I feel I belong to? Now, let me go into these different mechanisms in a bit more detail. Because they all start with I, we've come to call them the four I of group emotion convergence. Interaction, inclination, institutionalization, and identification. So what is it that we mean by interaction? 
So interaction refers to social interaction, interpersonal interaction, when people actually come together in one spot or meet within a virtual space and have a chance to interact with one another. Now, there are two reasons why as part of such interactions, emotions tend to converge. One reason is that it facilitates a process that's called emotion contagion. And that means that people tend to catch and automatically mimic the emotional expressions of other people. Now, if you're interacting with another person and you catch the emotion of that person, mimic it, and the other person catches your emotions, mimic it, then in that process, over time, the emotional feelings that are shared actually tend to become similar. And the other reason why interaction leads to convergence is that it facilitates a consensual interpretation of the situation, of the events that the group is facing. And to the extent that you see things happening to the group, that you interpret the situation which the group in, is in similarly, to that extent then the emotional responses to the situation, to the events, are also naturally similar. And as such, again, this interaction and sense-making process that takes place as part of the interaction facilitates uh, similar feelings in a group. Now, the other perspective is uh, that inclination matters. And that's more about the group members as people as opposed to the group process during which these people interact. So inclination really suggests that uh, people have different natural inclinations towards certain emotions. Uh, some people, for instance, might feel uh, more often uh, enthusiasm, excitement, and energy, and other people might feel more often um, depressed, sad, exhausted, these type of different tendencies that vary naturally between people. And the idea is that to the extent that in groups people come together that share natural tendencies towards certain emotions, specific inclinations towards certain emotions, then likely the group as a whole will be infused with those emotions. Thus, if you have a group that consists of people with natural inclinations towards positive emotions, most likely the group as a whole will also have a more positive group emotion to it. People will converge on a positive emotion. The uh, third account is institutionalization. And that's an account that suggests that we feel alike because of the emotional norms uh, that tend to govern group life and the rituals uh, in which group members tend to engage in. Now, to explain emotional norms in a very simple example, uh, just think of perhaps the emotions that are expected from you, let's say, on a uh, party at Friday night, uh, as opposed to um, a, a funeral. Right? The expectations for what type of emotions we are supposed to display uh, are fundamentally different between these two situations. And similarly, um, the emotions that are expected from employees in a trendy design agency might be very different from those that are expected in a traditional accounting firm. Now, to the extent that groups and organizations, collectivities, uphold certain emotional norms, those emotional norms then will, of course, facilitate the convergence of the feelings that are shared when people are in these group settings. The final mechanism is called identification. And identification accounts suggest that emotions converge in groups because, or to the extent actually, that the group members uh, identify with the group. Uh, the idea is that when we are identifying with a group, then the events that happen to the group, the situation that the group is in, they feel like as if they would happen to us individually. And so we respond to these events, to these situations emotionally, even if we're not directly personally involved. 
Take for example an organization that is involved in a, um, in a scandal. Uh, now, for those who are identifying strongly with the organization, they might experience feelings of guilt uh, and share those feelings within the group, within the organization, even if they individually haven't done any wrongdoing. So interaction, inclination, institutionalization and identification. These are four different ways of explaining why people in groups converge in their feelings. Now, we don't think that these are actually uh, competing explanations. And so in our paper, we synthesize and integrate them into one overarching parsimonious model that explains the convergence of emotions in groups. We also, in our paper, advance a common language for emotion scholars to speak about group emotions in distinct ways. We prune the confusion around the many terms that exist to describe group emotions. And we also provide evidence that group emotions are not just a phenomenon that can be witnessed in small groups uh, of interacting co-located team members. Uh, but instead, group emotions can be seen in larger social units, in, in, in large groups, in, in organizations. Um, and so we hope that our review will open up new avenues for group emotion research at all levels of analysis. And finally, for those of you who wish to apply the insights that we extract from these decades of emotional research that we reviewed, there is useful information in our paper concerning how the emotions that are shared in groups and teams can be shaped and changed.